Please take your seats. The program will begin momentarily. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to be here today with three leaders from the Aspen Global, Global Leadership Network who are driving change and disrupting industries by using technology and alternative business models. They're really approaching some entrenched problems with new solutions. I've been so inspired to talk to them and to learn about what they're doing, and I'm sure you will be as well. I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I'd love to open it up to, to all of you at the end of this. Um, First to my left is Rodney Williams, co-founder and president of Solo Funds, a company that's, enabled, that's enabling community banking with a specific focus on the subprime market, which has been so underserved. Uh, Rodney was a brand manager of digital strategy at Procter & Gamble and is a Henry Crown Fellow. Great to have you. Carter Dredge is a lead futurist for SS. SSM Health, a large Catholic not-for-profit healthcare system in St. Louis that's doing some amazing work breaking up the insulin market and many other things. The first American to be accepted into a unique business program at the University of Cambridge and is a Health Innovators Fellow. And finally, Ashley Bell is Chairman and CEO of Redemption Holding Company. Ashley was a former White House Policy Advisor for Entrepreneurship and Innovation in the Trump Administration founded the 2020 Bipartisan Justice Center, served on the Hall County Board of Commissioners in Georgia, which is quite interesting, and is part of our Civil Society Fellowship. So let's get started. You're all entrepreneurs. Thank you. <laughs> You're all entrepreneurs out there pounding the pavement every day. Give me your elevator pitch. What are you trying to do here? Rodney, you go first. Well, hello, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the, the premise of why I do what I do started from a personal experience of my friends and family needing access to short-term capital. Uh, and then when they did have capital, they didn't have many ways to grow that capital. It's a, it's a problem that's plagued across middle-class America. Uh, so coming out of my first startup was a company called Listener within financial services. Uh, I decided that my Henry Crown Fellowship Social Impact Venture was going to go out and make a difference in the world. So we created Solo Funds. Solo is short for social loans. And we allow people to lend and borrow from each other. Number one, giving access to short-term capital under $600 when people need it. On the other side of the marketplace, we're allowing everyday Americans to fund that capital and make a return. What has happened over the past four years is that it's quickly become the largest consumer finance company ever founded by African American. We're a B Corp. We're actually lending or enabling about $20 million of capital to underserved communities every month. And that's solo. Pretty good elevator pitch. <laughs> Carter, you're up next. Yeah, so <clears throat> I work as a futurist for SSM Health. It's a large organization, about 40,000 employees. Um, we serve millions of patients a year. But in this capacity and in, in this role today, talking about a, a new innovative venture we launched with several other health systems and philanthropies called Civica RX, which is designed to disrupt the generic drug industry and deliver essential medicines at cost. Getting access to essential medicines in the United States is, is challenging at times, either from shortages or because they're prohibitively expensive. We pooled together scale all across the United States. We launched the company. It's a nonprofit, 501c4. It's structured in an entirely new way, something that we call a healthcare utility. Mm -hmm. So novel when we formed this, the University of Cambridge started a new strategic initiative called the Healthcare Utility Initiative to unpack how these businesses work. Within about two years, we aggregated up contracts with over a third of the total inpatient hospital capacity in the United States. And after... <laughs> Thank you. And uh, just a little over four years, our medicines have been able to treat 55 million people um, with essential life-saving medicines. And we've also started to replicate this business structure in retail medicines, where we aggregated over 140 million covered lives through doing the same thing we did with hospitals, with insurance companies. And that enabled us to actually be a, play a critical role in reducing the price of insulin for people that need it earlier this spring by over 70%. So, which has been a medicine that's been around for 100 years, and it's been very expensive to where recently studies show that 25% of Americans had to inappropriately ration it due to cost. Mm -hmm. So new business, 
new business genre and new structure to deliver essential services in a novel way to replatform how healthcare services are delivered in our country. That's what we're working on. I say, wow, every time I hear this, <laughs> it's great stuff. Ashley, you're up. Yeah, so uh, my name is Ashley Bell. I'm CEO of Ready Life, which is my fintech, and then Redemption Holding Company, which owns the first black uh, bank in the Rockies, where you are now. It's the first time ever that's ever happened. And when I talk about my why and kind of how I got here, uh, my, my co-founder of my companies uh, is Dr. Bernice A. King, who knows the youngest daughter of Martin Luther King Jr., and Dr. King and I, uh, you know, talk about her, a lot of her father's quotes. You will hear a lot of people talk about them all the time. But one that doesn't get a lot of play is the fact of his quote about the inseparable twins of racial inequality and economic inequality. You cannot have a conversation about racial inequity if you don't talk about economic. They are inseparable. And the night, that, uh, the day that her father was assassinated, we had over 140 black-owned banks in America. Today you have 17. And that precipitous decline has evaporated hope all across, of our, all across our country. And so every time America has an economic downturn, we lose a third of those black banks. 1976, a small black bank that my great-grandfather started in a small town in Georgia that was built to finance products for sharecroppers. We actually were in the business of financing black farmers, buying back their land from their former slave owners. Part of that was my family's legacy. We bought our farm bag from our former owners. This bank went under in 1976, like a third of the black banks that went under because the economy went down, opportunity was uh, dwindling across the country. Carter had so many things going on, and part of the answer was let's overregulate the banks. And let's be honest, regulators are police. Uh, and at the end of the day, we know policing acts a little different in different neighborhoods. And in our neighborhood, we got shut down. And with that, a lot of opportunity was gone. So Dr. King and I saw this as an opportunity for a little bit of redemption, to rethink what black banking can look like in our country. And that's why we named this bank Redemption. That's why we bought a bank in the widest city, in the widest state, in the widest place possible, which is Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> and hopefully we can talk a little bit about why that's the case. Uh, but we think this, coupled with the power of financial technology that can do all the things that data can, can do to help underwrite differently. And we believe that we should live in a world where people should be able to own a home without credit scores. We believe that credit scores are just a proxy for race in this country. We believe that the entire time that they've been created, they've done nothing but perpetuate the system. We think there's a better way, and we can do that by underwriting people off of what really matters, their cash flow. There's no reason in this country, if you're paying $3,000 a month for rent in this country, that you can't afford to pay a $3,000 a month mortgage. There's people in this country paying more than people, renting than people pay that own their home. That's not fair. And we're rewriting the rules on that. Told you. <laughs> I told you you would be inspired. Um, Carter, what's your why? It's, it's quite a story. Huh. So I grew up in a four generation home. My great grandmother was born in the 1800s. Uh, she later died in the, in the 1990s. My grandfather, my mother, and me and my twin brother. How this came to be is when my mom was 15 years old, she was in a very serious car accident. Um, she was on the freeway. A lady driving the car with my grandmother's friend had a heart attack and uh, careened out of control. The car went along some guardrails, flipped upside down, landed upside down on railroad tracks off an overpass. My grandmother was killed, the lady driving the car was killed, and my mom was paralyzed, barely survived. She had over 300 stitches in her head alone, and she had a lot of health challenges. So growing up, me and my twin brother were miraculously born, and I was surrounded by people in my early developmental years who had massive health challenges. My great-grandmother was blind and homebound for a long time. My grandfather struggled with cancer as he helped to take care of his mother, my mother, and me and my twin brother. My mom was homebound starting in her 40s and died of cancer in her early 50s. And I was just surrounded by people that really needed something, really needed health care. Sometimes it worked great. Sometimes it didn't. And from that early age, I really have always had a passion to help people who needed the most help related to health challenges. And so I really decided that I was going to figure out 
how to make sustainable business generative solutions to take care of the most vulnerable. Because when I see, when I see a problem in the system, I don't just think of GDP. I think of human suffering. And I think of real people like my own family. And that's my why. That's why I do what I do. Mm-hmm. Rodney, uh, you started at P&G, pretty traditional business start. What is your why for why for for jumping off of the established track to do a startup like this? Well, let's be clear. It's my second time doing it. Okay. So uh, <laughs> my first was a company called Listener. Uh, it's a four times CNBC disruptor company. In 2012, raising capital out of Cincinnati, Ohio, it was one of the first to do it. We raised about $40 million dollars. That was a payment technology that wanted to create universal ways to pay. And at that time, I really felt like contactless solutions was predicated on an expensive device called an NFC. And when you use that to mobile pay, you will exclude a large amount of the population that would not be able to pay with Apple Pay, right? And so I wanted to create something that was more universal, and that was ultrasonic technology, um, data over audio. We did 17 patents. I traveled the world. It's being used in Angola, Nigeria, and you name it. It's kind of how I got it. became a Hindu Crown Fellow. I didn't necessarily see the impact in my community, though. And I, and I had a great idea, and it did really well. And I remember coming home from Christmas one time, and when you are, and, and I, when you are the one that make, made it in the family. I don't really have a, a bunch of legacy stories. It's kind of just me when I come home, right? Um, but everyone lines up and says, hey, can I borrow $50? <laughs> can I borrow $100? Can I borrow $200? Can I keep the rent on? <laughs> And at some point in time, I got really upset about it because I, I thought it was just a problem with my family. When I double-clicked it, it was a problem that was much bigger than just my family. It was a problem with everyone else. So when I decided for my next thing, I was going to go out and go out and change the way the financial system works. And, and to, to do that, I was, we were going to have to start on a blank piece of paper and say, hey, if I was going to design a new type of product, how would I design it? What would I do? And, and then obviously it has turned into what I do every day. So I want to get into how you guys are doing it um, and how you're using different methods to challenge the structures that are there. Um, Ashley, you want to start? Yeah. You know, I'll start with the tech side of it because when you talk about creating wealth, um, and you're, especially if you're black and you're trying to raise money, it's far too many times people think if you're trying to help people to look like you, it must be alms. It must be charity. You're probably not going to make any money. So they're kind of like, we'll send you to our social impact folks, uh, which is nothing wrong with that, but black people like making money too. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with doing that in a capitalist country. So the reality was that I had to realize if we're going to move the needle, I got to figure out a way to create a marketplace where everybody can make money. That's the bottom line. In America, that's the only way. If people just see you doing it as charity, it will only be as popular as the last martyr. Whoever that last martyr was, whether it was George Floyd or, whoever, or any other ones before him or the ones that will come after him, you got about a two and a half year span where America will care and then they won't. And then you're back where you started. So we have to figure out a way of building institutions and changing systems. And so for me, I went to the banks and I said, OK, look, you guys were redlining for decades. So raise your hand if you know what redlining is. Good. So redlining, for those that don't know, got some kids in here, just you would draw a red line and say the people in here can't get loans. And most of the time, they're black and brown and marginalized people. Well, Community Reinvestment Act was created to basically say, all right, we're going to force banks to do loans in this one area to try to undo that. Well, they're not really good at that. They, they, they're supposed to do it. They really don't. They're not good at it. But my thing was, let me help you be better at it. Because the people in that community don't trust you, first off. Because the top 10 banks in our country, all, every single one of them has a lawsuit or a consent decree for not giving loans to those exact same people. And that's in the last five years. <laughs> So we're not talking about a long time ago. So for me, it was, let me help you be better at this. And so I will go into that community. I will find people who I told you that model who are paying as much for rent as their neighbors are paying in a mortgage. So we know they can pay. But your credit score tells them they can't. And credit scores are fundamentally racist because if you truly believe a credit score, if you believe those big three companies, then you will honestly have to believe that 56% of black people are not trustworthy of owning a home. And we all know that's crazy. There's no half of a whole race of people that should not be able to live at a home. That's just wild that we would even accept that as a, as a predicated notion to even have a conversation. So what we do is we go and say, look, let's negotiate banks. Let's just base it off of what they're paying on their rent as a cap because we know they can pay it. But I don't want to use a credit score. So you get what you want. 
you get the CRA credit. So you can show the regulators that I'm loaning in this place, this place that I've created perpetual poverty for, for decades. But we get what we want, which is a, a alleviating the burden of a, of a racially systemic system called credit scores. So that part is hard because we're doing something that hadn't been done. You will hear a lot of people up here at this conference talk about alternative modeling for underwriting for a whole lot of stuff, auto loans, unsecured loans, but mortgages is a whole different ballgame. And that is how you create wealth in this country. The reason that black people have 10% of the wealth of white people in this country is because only 44% of black people own a home, 74% of white people own a home, and there is your gap. You close that gap, you can close the racial wealth gap. So if you had to actually like prove to the banks that the repayments are high, that the that- the people who are spending $3,000 to rent every month that they will pay a mortgage? Have, have you had to get data together to, to prove your yeah, case? Yeah, I mean, you, you, can show, you, can show, you can show the banks that they paid it. That's, that's well. The, the reality is if you look at Experian or any of the big three and you pull your credit score and you go to the bank, nobody's rent payments are on there. There's a couple of them that will do a boost to say, oh, you showed you pay your rent. Here's five extra points. It means nothing. Because even when we show, we mean marginalized communities, show that we have equal credit score and equal income, we still get higher interest rates even if we do get approved. It's a no-win proposition. The whole system is rigged. So for us, we have to not just advocate for justice, we must innovate for justice. And that innovation begins with creating new systemic plans and opportunities for people outside of the construct that has created racism in, 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 in our country in the first place. Such powerful points. Um, Carter, you have started a, not, a nonprofit, 501c34, that you said basically nobody owns it. So you're not going to be getting rich off of this. Nope. Um, and just explain how that works and how you've been able to sign up so many hospitals so quickly. Happy to. And building off what Ashley said, I think it's critical. Like, how do you create a sustainable business model? How do you actually start to shape and change the institutions that undergird what we know? So often, form follows finance. What's incented is what happens more often than not. When we looked at this problem, if many of you might remember, like, the whole incident with Martin Screlly, where there was this instance where there was a drug that got bought up, in this case it was Daraprim, to treat something called taxoplasmosis, which for most people is not a big deal. But if you're immunocompromised, et cetera, you could die. Mm. 5,400% change in one day. <laughs> and what happened is a lot of people that couldn't get this before they had real struggles. We looked at this problem, said, are we going to be able to do it through regulation? Too uncertain, too long. People are, are struggling. They're hurting now. The other thing we balanced was if we do a traditional startup, we could likely do it, but it's going to take a really long time to get there. And if it is successful, how do we make sure it doesn't perpetuate the same problem as before? We needed a new incentive structure, and we needed speed and scale. So what we did is we looked at a a critical set of essential drugs that were purchased directly from hospitals, which means we didn't have to, in this particular instance, directly confront the three PBMs that control 90% of the pharmaceutical market. We said we wanted to go directly where we could avert patient harm. We pooled together, day one, 500 hospitals before the business. Like, day one it launched, we had 500 hospitals engaged that we signed five-year contracts to purchase these drugs. We made a commitment that we were not going to bend when the market started to pick us off. Once you enter into a market, the incumbents can come in and just undercut you, and they squeeze you out until you go away. We had to enter big, and we had to enter long. We augmented that with $30 million of capital from philanthropists, including a billionaire philanthropist, and what we did is we set the company up that no one could own it. It's a nonprofit. It's governed by these systems, and the way we got financing was we financed it from the customers. And by doing that, it created a virtuous cycle. There was no external financing group trying to basically up the rents they wanted to extract. It was financed by customers who had philanthropists directly on the board, and we made it impossible to change the structure without unanimous voting to ever change the structure to deliver what we needed to. This is important because one last thing for us to talk about changing the institutions Many times when companies enter the space and they become to get access, because successful, they get bought by the very companies that are trying to get disrupted. They take them out of play. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to make sure from the very beginning that once the company entered the space, it would stay there. 
and it would not be taken out through acquisition or sale, which then would shorten its horizon. That's where we did it. Later, one other thing is once we proved there was a market, we got bipartisan support, and the federal government issued us a uh, $100 million to basically build a manufacturing plant in Virginia to secure the domestic supply of essential pharmaceuticals. We sell to the strategic national stockpile. We sell the excess in the open market for the same tra transparent price for everybody. And once we did that and could prove that success by success in the institutional business model, the state of California a couple months ago put in $50 million towards insulin alone because we'll be able to deliver that to all of the um, residents independent of economic income and others so we can do so very equitably. That's what we tried to do, but I totally agree with Ashley. You have to get the institutional players on board so they can perpetuate it. There was a quote I remember from the Aspen Institute that stuck with me. It's people that make things possible. It's institutions that make things permanent. Mm -hmm. And so as we tap into and shape these institutions, which is I'm so impressed with my partners here on this panel, they're working to change the financial flows, the institutions, to make things more equitable and just more right. I love it. Rodney, uh, you're using a B Corp. Uh, with your company. Could you explain how that works and, and how the financing is working and kind of regenerating? You actually said yesterday to me that you're growing so quickly, it's almost like an Uber model at this point, which I've never heard applied to consumer finance. <laughs> oh, we, we are Uber for loans. Um, <laughs> I, I, I will tell you that much, right? Um, uh, you can sign up in less than a minute and you make a request and the average time to funding in your account is less than eight minutes. That's from a complete stranger around the world, around the globe, not around the world, just the US only. So it does work like Uber. We've literally tracked, you know, you being a mom on the side of the road, I need a tow truck. And you can find us, get the loan, pay the tow truck using Apple Pay. And we've saved that problem at that specific moment in time. Um, so for us, I mean, we, we decided our entire approach to financial services is different. Um, we approached it from definitely a benefit corporation, which we believe that we can do well and do good. Um, so what that ultimately means is that a third party has come and look at our financials and when we talk about profit margin and the way we're distributing our business model, it, it's better. It does good and it's equal, right? And I think that's number one thing that we've done when you look at our business model. From, from our business model standpoint that I think is really, really important and how we kind of rewriting the rule of a financial service company is that... Um, We've done a lot of things differently. Borrowers set their own terms. This is you going to the bank and you telling the bank what you want to pay. That's solo. Borrowers come in, make a request. They then tell the market what they want to pay for it. And they do that in a voluntary tip and donation. And something else that they said wouldn't work. But it feels good when a borrower does this, right? Mm -hmm. um, as a lending member, I look at the loan and I decide to lend based on that tip. The donation goes to solo. But we are an entire platform of a marketplace. We do not lend our capital or lend anything ourselves. What we do is make it safe. Make it safe, number one, by the underwriting that we do using cash flow. We believe it's the best measure in the world. I don't know why most are not using it. Um, we do not use any of the traditional systems to, to underwrite. Cash flow, and by the way, works five times better. So we're doing 60,000 yeah. loans per month, and our default rate is 5% for the worst, highest risk folks. Well, well that's what they told us. Right? <laughs> um, now, that's that underwriting. Now, we handle all money movement. Why do you, when you get a loan today, do you have to come back and manually pay when it's due? It should kind of be automatically set up. We can connect to the banking systems. We can see when you have that balance, and we should be a auto way to automatically do that. And if it's not there, we shouldn't pull it and get an overdraft. These are just standard things that are built into solo. Also, from a recovery standpoint, we don't outsource recovery. We don't outsource anything. So we don't sell our data. We actually handle the recovery of the loans post delinquency. Now that's, so when you do technically marketplace, origination, underwriting, recovery, there's more areas for you to extract revenue so that you don't have to extract revenue on the backs of the borrower, mm. right? And you can create a balanced product. So that's technically what we've done. Balance means lenders make returns. Our lenders make average of 20% APY. Borrowers get capital at an average of 13.4%, right? We help move it all. <laughs> we make a little slim piece, right? And that's how this whole thing has been able to work when everyone said it wouldn't. 
And can you just give me a quick beat on the subprime market? There's kind of a familiar theme here of untapped markets, people not having fair access to resources. But you know, you would think that this market would be crowded with all sorts of competition, but but you've thought you found that it was completely neglected. Completely neglected. It's crowded, but it's crowded with subprime credit cards. Capital One. It's crowded. It's very crowded. It's a hundred and ninety billion dollar market. That's the fastest growing consumer finance market. One of the largest investors in that market is BlackRock. Do what you want with that information. Mm. <laughs> it's doing very, very well, mm. right? Now, the problem with that is I think payday loans have had, had a bad PR, so they are a smaller portion of subprime lending today than they've ever been. And then fintechs who have tried to go after it tend to get squashed. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening, including us. We face our level of scrutiny. If you can do a Google search, you'll see it. Now, what we, what we understand is there's a, there's a vested interest to protect the credit industry that operates in subprime lending, who we've actually just commissioned a total cost report where legally, and this is one of my biggest problems with the financial service system, is legally there are fees excluded from the APR. If you go get a mortgage, you know all the other fees that you tend to have to pay. Well, in a credit card, it's the same way. There's fees that are included and there's fees that are not. Annual fees, subscription fees, transaction fees, late fees. But something like a late fee, when 80% of consumers in this market pay late is not included in the cost of that particular credit. Mm -hmm. So what I'm ultimately getting at is that the entire infrastructure of it is kind of designed to, to take advantage of, of a group that has not had the innovation, and more importantly, hasn't had a founder who has experienced it that can point it out mm -hmm. and say, well, we don't want to do that anymore. And that's, that's really the biggest difference between our company and how we approached it. And I'll, I'll leave with my, our final measure, and this is what we hold our company to. The average financial service company has a net promoter score of a 44. Uh, we have a 90. It's equivalent to Nike or Patagonia. <laughs> that means every day that when we survey our users, 90% feel a level of commitment to the community that we've built. And that's the emergence of something very, very different, a, 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 a financial service company that's much more focused on how we make our consumers feel than how we benefit from them. So taking on entrenched interests, what is your vision when you're thinking about all of you, where you hope to be two or three years from now, or maybe 10 years from now? You want to break out of the Rocky Mountain region? Well, uh, I think that's, well, let's, let's be real. You know, <laughs> I came here for the regulatory environment, not, you know, <laughs> um, I love Salt Lake City. It's great. <laughs> um, but, but the reality is this. The reason we chose Salt Lake City because the, regula the regulatory environment is great. It's a great place to launch a national platform. But the reason that black banks struggle, let's, let's, let's separate financial institutions from banks. We still live in a country where banks are necessary, okay? A lot of fintechs, I own a fintech, you got a lot of fintechs out here, a lot of them sit on top of banks many times, Cash App, Venmo, all that stuff. The reality is this. Cash out financial technology is crippling the black community quicker than anything else when it comes to the money movement between the cash apps and Venmos of the world. And here's exactly why. Because the black dollar that circulates in the community, like every other community, if you look at it, the black dollar sometimes people say is between six hours and six days. It stays in our community. In the Hispanic community, it's got a couple months. Asian community, half a year. Um, it, it goes up. That dollar circulating is how jobs are created, right? Well, if I'm using Cash App, and it's funny, uh, watch this. Ra raise your hand if you use Cash App. Raise your hand if you use Venmo. A stark racial difference just happened. <laughs> Black and brown people use Cash App. White folks use Venmo. <laughs> that is on purpose. It's in every rap song you can think of. Cash <laughs> App is in there. And it's a, it, they purposely spend a lot of money to get into the culture. But what's happening is I'm on MLK in Atlanta, and I, if I, my barber says to me, hey, actually, I need $50 for this haircut, I'm like, okay, I, I only take Cash App. So I got to pay my barber. In, 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 through Cash App, I am literally 400 feet from a black-owned bank. But that $50 leaves MLK in Atlanta and goes to a small bank in Ohio where Cash App holds its money and not to that black bank that's right down the street. And even for those of us that are marketing fintechs, too many times people think that it's black owned. Like I will tell people all the time, I'm black owned fintech, but the only way I can bank black is to own a bank, which is why I own a bank. Because otherwise I'm actually exporting the capital out of my community at a higher velocity than it's already leaving. This is what I see for the future. And to answer your question, look, we must have more 
centers of hope financially, and banks are a part of that. You cannot live in this country without banking somewhere. We only have 16, almost 17 black banks. How do you create more stronger black banks? People in this room, this is, what I'm, this is your action that I'm throwing out here. This concept of impact banking. There's not anyone in this room right now that doesn't have a bank somewhere. Ask yourself, does your bank reflect your values? Far too many times we don't ask that question. Far too many times your money is sitting in a bank that is perpetuating racism in communities and stifling growth and innovation, and you're not even thinking about it. Anybody can bank anywhere. Think about banking differently, banking impactfully. I just did a deal. You can look this up on CNBC last week where I did for the National Football League, $100 million deal for the National Football League with 16 different MDIs, MDIs of minority-owned banks. Why is that important? Because black banks and minority banks are in concentrated areas where everybody is trying to make it. And they're only one economic downturn away from not existing. But if you took your corporation and you said, went to your CFO and said, look, guys, we're going to go to the market for debt. We got to do $75 million anyway. That's what you're going to do anyway. Ask them, are we using any diverse lenders? You got any black banks in your capital stack? A bank's a bank. They're going to give you the exact same service. But unless you ask these questions, then these banks will be relegated to living in fragile communities and being one bad quarter away from not existing. We will be the last generation in this country to know that black banks even existed unless all of us think differently and we bank our values. By putting money in those banks, yeah, you won't feel it. It won't cost you a dime more, but that will turn into home loans for people who need it. That will turn into loans for their nonprofits. That will give them non-predatory rates in communities. We cannot live in a world where we totally ignore banks and you, everyone in this room, has an option. But please believe it is an option. If you do nothing, that is still a choice. I agree. Yeah. I, I think a lot about challenging incumbents. I think a lot about how do you change a monopoly or an oligopoly. And the term that we use within this work that we're leading is we actually call it disruptive collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so if many people are probably familiar with disruptive innovation, a term that was popularized by Clayton Christensen from Harvard Business School. Clay was an advisor when we set up Civic RX. And in this case, we didn't need a new product. Like we had a drug, it existed, it was cheap. Many of these drugs were 30 years old. But we needed to work differently in how we solve the problem. We need to collaborate. So this, dis this notion of disruptive collaboration is how do you get this massive scale quick enough to challenge the incumbent before you know, it's too late, uh, to challenge it with enough scale that it can be efficacious? So what I think about is we have meaningfully changed the dynamic in an oligopoly of pharma that many people said was impossible. When we were starting this, people told us, don't even start. <laughs> We've made impact. We're looking for other places, and we're collaborating with people all over the world of what it means to challenge an oligopoly. One other nuanced thing about introducing these new nonprofit vehicles that we call healthcare utilities that makes it incredibly powerful is we don't have to traditionally win to win. What I mean by that is these entities, it's less about market share and it's more about market effect. If we go to an industry where there is excess rents, rents that are taken that are not needed on people that don't have choices, inelastic demand would be the economic term. I have to have it to live. If we force competition in those areas, just as we did in insulin, and they bring insulin prices down, even if we don't take the whole market, the market's better mm -hmm. because people can get it. So for us to beat an oligopoly, the way we set up these healthcare utilities, it just means we have to effectively challenge them. If we challenge them, we can win because we set it up that the people who are paying the excess costs or can't get the product win by better access, lower costs, and overall, a higher quality product in healthcare that they need. There's a, something in healthcare called the iron triangle. Improve quality, improve access, improve cost, pick two of the three. There's been an ideology that says you can only change those. These new initiatives that we've done have broken the iron triangle. Lower cost, better access, 
higher quality. I think there's a reason it started in healthcare because these businesses are so huge. Two businesses control 80% of the dialysis market. Two firms control 90% of the linear acceleration market to their point of basic cancer treatment is inaccessible to 70% of the world's population. In Rhode Island, they have like, I don't know, 12 linear accelerators with a million people. The country of Ethiopia has a population of 117 million and they have one. These problems don't require new science. They require disruptive collaboration to deliver known, solid, evidence-based care at a lower and sustainable cost. And it's by working together in structurally new ways that make it very possible if we do it right. Rodney, where's your future? Um, you know, our goal, right now we, we grow about 15 to 20% per month um, organically. Um, if we can, as we continue that pace, we'll deliver about a billion dollars back to underserved communities by Q1 of next year. Um, we have a flywheel that is something magical here, right? We're a profitable business with just about 100 employees. Um, our goal is to, if you think about us in, in a very simple form, um, this small, I call it bridge loans, are the difference between $1,900 of additional debt every 12 months for this demographic. Um, the 20% APY on someone who has $2,000 of savings in a bank account paid for Christmas, right? Um, so we're doing this for middle-class America, which is over $200 million. Um, We're going to start uh, enter our first global market uh, this year with Nigeria being the first one. Um, our goal is to redefine what we call community banking, where people, the deposit holders, have the choice on how their money makes an impact. And the people who need it have flexible, innovative credit products that don't disproportionately hurt them. It's a simple mission. It's a simple goal. But we want to do that across the 5 billion middle class citizens of our globe. And, and that's what I look like. That's what we look like five years from now. Amazing. Um, I'd like to open it up to all of you for questions. Um, the time is passing us quickly. Guadalupe, you want to go first? Hi, I'm Guadalupe Rodriguez. Oh, can you actually wait for the mic? Hi, Guadalupe Rodriguez. Uh, I'm the chief investment officer for a uh, Mexican family office. I hear you. And I want to know if you're raising money. I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that's, a, that's a great question because, first off, ideas can be heard, but if they're not invested in, then they can't go anywhere. I think all of us are always investing, always looking for investors, but the right investors is also key. It is equally as predatory for middle class people to find a loan as it is for black people and brown people who have venture firms or venture backed companies to find capital that's not predatory. Because a lot of people, when you have a good idea, think that, wow, because you're black or brown, you won't be able to raise the money. I'll come give it to you, but I want to take control of your company or get a larger than fair share. I, I think that. <laughs> and I did say I was a lawyer to start off with, so uh, yeah, so that, that's part of it. But yes, I think, the, are, you, are you taking money? Oh, always. Okay. We're going to put it to use. You're taking money as well. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I wrote my question down so I wouldn't forget it. Um, so I worked in banking for over 13 years, retail banking. Um, so I definitely understand what you guys are talking about in terms of the, the disparities. Um, I don't believe that financial literacy programs developed by major banks are effective in narrowing um, the wealth gap and addressing systemic inequalities. So I'm curious to hear about um, how you are actively investing in financial wellness education um, in marginalized communities. Well, can you stop, like throw away all the books. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> it's useless. It's useless. There's two people, and, uh, and, and it's two people, people with money and people with don't money. The only way you know how to handle money is to have money. It's that simple. You have to give people money, and you have to give them rules to learn. That's it. That's it, right? And, and, and what, I, what that looks like for us is that we, we, we have literacy, but it's not important. We, we designed a product that teaches you what to do, right? It's very simple. Your score goes up when you pay on time. If you pay late, your score goes down. Right. When your score goes up, you get to request more. It's that simple. 
One, yes. Do you want a higher score when you make a request? You should keep a higher daily balance. The problem with the credit score when you talk to an average citizen is they don't understand it. It doesn't matter how many times I read, I, they actually, uh, they, actually uh, they don't tell you. Every score is proprietary, if I'm correct or not, right? So they don't tell you how to increase it or to make it better. So what are you teaching? And if you teach someone to pay a loan over time versus pay it off, or said better, like what we teach is don't request what you don't, can't pay back. Don't ask for something you do not need. If I go right now, even in my financial position, and I say I want a $1,000 loan, they're going to give, try to give me $100,000. And that's the problem with the financial system. So there's no way to teach that. What you got to do is create a new rules-based system, give them money, and, and then reward them for making better choices. That's what we think. Same. I know you got to get to a lot of questions, so I'll let you get yeah. to the next one. Right in the front row. Hello, my name is Dan Munoz. I am 17 years old. I'm from the Basel Scholar Foundation. I come from a very underserved area. I, my mom is a single mother, and I understand the struggles that come with payday loans, I understand the struggles that come with all these different avenues in which that are very predatory towards lower income people. I would like to ask, uh, you all talk about middle income people, what about low income and marginalized communities such as McAllen, Texas, where I live? You know, that, Good question. Well, well, first off, when we built Ready Life, it was for, our mortgage product is for right down the middle of people that are low income to middle income because everybody's paying rent somewhere. And our credit modeling is based off of what we think makes the most sense. Whatever you're paying in rent, we know you can pay in a mortgage. We also supplement that with things that really matter. We're creating a credit model that separates your needs versus your wants. Now, it should matter to me if I'm trying to give you a mortgage, if you paid your light bill, if you paid your rent, if you paid your car note to make sure you can get to work, the things that are necessary, that you know everyday people are struggling every day to do, and they make it happen. But the credit system doesn't understand is that Credit cards are really like a, a safety net middle time, many times for middle America. They use them for car breaks down, somebody got sick, something happened, and they will carry that balance until they can pay it off. But the whole time they're carrying that balance, the three credit bureaus have just tanked their score. They tanked their score for a year while you're trying to pay that off when the reality was, is that your parents probably paid that rent on time, or almost on time every month. But the system tells them they couldn't have a house because the alternator went out two years ago, or they missed a Discover card payment. We, as, as we just talked about, we have to create a new system. And educating people on how to, how to play a rigged game is not going to move us forward. Other questions in the back? Hi, for Rodney and Ashley, um, the pay card industry has really changed how people are getting paid who aren't traditionally in the banking system. Are either of you looking at either partnering with a platform that does that or making your own? I got prepaid, is that what you mean? Uh, yeah, like so you get paid with a debit card. Yeah, uh, one of my uh, brother organizations, Mocafi, does that. Well, they does a good job of that. Um, it, it's, that's one of those companies that is very needed, but like every other company, it's hard to scale it. Look at Mocafi, they do a great job, but the bottom line is that prepaid card that he has primarily only works when there's a slush of government money coming through and the government needs to get it to people. And that's great when you're going through COVID and you gotta find somebody that lives under a bridge or doesn't have a real address, but they need a card to get the money. But then what happens when the government money dries up? It's, it's, really, it's a really hard business model, but you're right. Uh, we, anybody that needs prepaid credit cards or prepaid debit cards, Mocafi and Wole do a great job. Question over here. On the end, the microphone is coming your way. Um, Carter, I've, I worked in healthcare industry for nearly 40 years, and you're taking on one of the five major factors that contribute to healthcare, the pharmaceutical in industry. For those who don't know, insurance, PBMs, um, device companies, and trial lawyers all contribute to healthcare costs that are not directly related to making somebody feel better. Uh, you're going against Big Pharma, which is a huge obstacle. Mm -hmm. Are you getting feedback from them, and what does that look like? Yeah, so, I mean, we're, you know, I think for a while when we started, you know, the concept of innovation, if you're thinking about ideas, when we first started, we said, what's the rebar? This kind of comes from this notion, comes from a Harvard business case study from Clay Christensen of saying when the steel industry got disrupted, they didn't start with high-end steel, we started, in this case, with inpatient generic drugs for two reasons, because we knew there was going to be competitive pressure. One, 
Where was it simple enough that we could enter meaningfully at scale and not have to develop all of our own drugs that would just take a super long time to get to critical mass? We're already over, we're about 80 drugs already instead of just four or five if we'd had to develop everything from scratch. And second, it was a market that we could enter without getting crushed to start because we didn't have to go head to head with the PBMs at first. So we are getting pushback. However, we're also getting responses. <laughs> we're getting positive responses from a lot of people. These are businesses, which is why the structure is important. It's hard to hate. This is how much I get paid to serve on the board of Civica. Nothing. This is how much no one owns the equity. No one's looking for the exit. So when we're saying, when we, we structured it in a way that said this is about solving a problem that really needed to be solved, we weren't trying to take away that novel innovation about the next blockbuster. We're just trying to say when it eventually comes off patent, it should become affordable. We can't afford to pay premium prices on everything. No economy in the world can. So we're getting pressure, but it's hardening our focus, and it's helping us drive that. The one thing I'd say about, and then just a, when we do have challenges, and they do come, we had some companies for a while, they tried to really kind of just edge us out, but we had such critical force and everything that we were able to go through but I think of something that really helps me hone a mental tenacity with facing these really challenging oligopolies. Before my mom died, and I was doing some, uh, this really hard, innovative work, I called my mom. Again, she's paralyzed. She's homebound. She has cancer. And I was talking to her about how hard this work is. I'm like, hey, this is hard work. <laughs> people don't like it. The incumbents don't like it. You're trying to convince other people to fund it. And she asked a simple question that put me in my place that I've never tried to move from that center. And she just said, do you think being paralyzed is easy? I felt about this big. But I committed, and then she said something. She said, Carter, you're an insider. You know how these systems work better than anybody I know. You're a leader, which means you have a choice. You don't just have to take it as it is. She said, for me... I'm homebound. I'm paralyzed. I'm just a taker. I'll take only things the system can give. You're a leader. You have a choice. So what I'm just so impressed with, these other panelists, as well as the people who put on and attend Aspen Ideas, it's people who choose to exercise the choice right. when the challenges come. Has there been pushback? Absolutely. Have there been challenges? Absolutely. Have there been sleepless nights that we have no idea how we're going to overcome the next barrier? Absolutely. But is there a commitment that's connected to values, connected to something that is not just about success, but success to significance to change the game for people who just have to be takers in that moment? That's why I push for it. And that's what's needed. And so when the, when the headwinds come, and they do come, that's what we push through. Thank you for your question. And to close here, um, Carter, you just used the term from success to significance, which is really the, the foundation of the Henry Crown Fellowship. I was also fortunate enough to be a Henry Crown Fellow. I would just like to ask you all, this is sometimes lonely work, um, what role has the fellowship uh, uh, provided for you? You're all in various programs, just quickly, and, and um, in terms of that endurance to keep, to keep challenging the way you are. Actually. So I'm a civil society fellow, which was founded by two Henry Crown fellows. And I actually named my bank after my class, which was Mission Redemption. When I talk about redemption, I say that because we are all trying to redeem this nation. What I'm discussing today and what you've heard today is a story that is only unique to this country. Black people in this country have a journey that no one else has had to take. That is, we came to this country as capital on somebody's balance sheet. And we were told that we need to take a journey to become capitalists. And that journey is what you're hearing. How do you go from being capital to becoming capitalists? The road to trying to get access to this capital, every study shows that when black people apply for loans, it is 57% 57 of them suffer mental anxiety, depression. What is privilege? Privilege is applying for a loan and not thinking about whether or not your race is a factor. That is what we want everyone to have. That is how we redeem this country. So if you're investing in a business, if you're thinking about banking your values, ask yourself, is the place where you're putting your money, do they offer grace and do they offer mercy? If they can do those things, then you can have redemption. Rodney. 
You know, I think the fellowship has just been incredible. Um, you know, half of them turned into my investors. Um, they, they, they saw it from the beginning, right? They saw the, the ugly logo and the terrible website <laughs> <laughs> and the presentation that looks pretty difficult, right? To see where it is today, um, they're, they're in it together. We're in this together. And I didn't know I needed another family. And I got one. And Carter. include, you know, funny enough, I was in this very room at the end of a week long seminar as part of the Health Innovators Fellowship, where I made that commitment and resolve to basically pursue this vision, develop this genre in consortium with my family. We sold our house, moved to the UK, dove headfirst into this program, all with the support of the fellows. They became uh, confidants, admi uh, advisors, advocates, networkers. It, I can honestly say uh, my involvement in the Aspen Institute changed the, career, the trajectory of my life. It changed my life, and it made me want to do better for others. I would like you all to join me in thanking our panelists. Keep an eye on them. <laughs> Thanks so much, and you have seen three very powerful combinations of ambition and mission, and we can't wait to see what you all do. Thank you, Rebecca. You got us out right on time.